My name is Joel, I'm one of the leaders here at Emmanuel, and we are in the third part of a series of messages going through the Apostles' Creed. And today we're going to talk about the fact that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Um, we're going slightly out of the order, okay? So someone in a couple of weeks is going to do the part where it says, I believe in, in the Son, Jesus Christ, the only begotten, our Lord, uh, so we're playing with the order, which is dangerous. We're playing with fire, and churches that do that often explode. So, so I, I hope that we don't, you know, I hope nothing bad happens, but trust me, I think we're okay. I think we're okay. I'm going to take the risk. We're going to go to the virgin birth today, and to help us with that, I'm going to go to Luke chapter 1, which describes the way that Jesus' mother Mary came to know uh, that she was with child. Um, so let me, or going, going to be with child. So let me read to you from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to verse 38. It says this, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man. That means kind of engaged, but they kind of engaged on steroids. So in the, in the first century Jewish culture, betrothed was a notch up from just engaged. You were really, if you got out of engagement, it was, it was more like a divorce. It was a big deal. Uh, betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary and he came to her and said greetings O favored one the Lord is with you but she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be and the angel said to her do not be afraid Mary for you have found favor with God and behold you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Father, we thank you for these words of Scripture that are life to us. They're a gift to us, and they are light in the dark places of our lives. And I pray that you would breathe out your, your life. And you would shine out your light. You would speak out your truth. And our hearts would be affected and changed. And uh, Lord, our lives would, be, would benefit. And we would be strengthened, encouraged, uh, enabled to trust you and uh, lean into you in, in new ways because of what you say to us through these words today. In Jesus' name, amen. I mean, let me simply talk to you today about, uh, really, is the virgin birth real for a start? And secondly, does it matter? Uh, is, it, is it important? And then finally, does it actually apply to our lives today, 20 centuries later? That's where I want us to go. First of all, is it real? It's, it's one of those stories in the Bible that obviously gets uh, treated with skepticism, in, in our context today, and, and actually particularly so. It's, it's a strange thing. Quite often people will say, yeah, I, I believe in God. In fact, I believe quite a lot of what the Bible says. I, I even believe in Jesus. I, I, might, I might believe even in some of the miracles, but I don't really buy that virgin birth thing. That's just, that's just ludicrous. I don't believe that. Uh, there are people who will go that far. And then, of course, there's the, the more immediate reaction of just contempt. It's just, it's just stupid. The whole idea of <laughs> this man being born from a virgin, it's all obviously Chinese whispers. It's all just built out of myths and legends. 
It's not real. They believed it then, but we shouldn't believe it now. That's just foolishness. Now, I, I, let me start with that because I, I would at least want to challenge the assumption I think that's based on. I would base that on what, what we might call chronological snobbery, which is the, the idea that because something uh, is from the past, because, because a miracle story is ancient, uh, it's, it's, it's to be dis dismissed immediately because people in ancient times were a little bit childish. They were, they were like children. Uh, not like us. We're sophisticated. We've grown up. We're wiser than they are because we, we're around now. And they're around then. We're around now. We have you know, credit cards and penicillin and space shuttles and phones. And so we know way, way more. The, the idea there, I guess, then, is, is because, because <laughs> people like these ones lived 20 centuries ago, they, they thought virgin births were, were fine. They thought, oh, of course, yeah, this baby's been born. Might, might be that the baby's been born a virgin. Probably is. Yeah, let's believe that. We're credulous. We're from the first century, so we're a bit stupid. That, that's the kind of, I mean, I, I know I sound like I'm being a little bit cruel, but I'm afraid that's the way we often think, isn't it? I've heard people say, well, the resurrection of Jesus clearly didn't happen. The only reason it's taken any momentum and been taken seriously is because people believed it in those days because they didn't know about modern science then. But the thing is, it doesn't take modern science to tell you that people don't rise from the dead. It doesn't take modern science to tell you that babies don't come from virgins. We, we know that. We knew that before. People have known that. Even back in Bible times, they knew that. They knew that. In fact, not only can we kind of assume they knew it, we know they did because in Matthew's Gospel, it says that Joseph when he found out that Mary was pregnant, was getting ready to divorce her. Like I said, betrothal meant that you had to separate with a ser serious legal process. He was all set to do it. He was planning to separate, to not marry her. Why? Because they had that conversation, the one that people laugh about. It really had, people say, oh, imagine if... It's not, it's not an imaginative thing. It must have happened. Mary must have come to Joseph. This is history. This isn't comedy. It sounds like it. That, that he, she came to him and said, I'm pregnant. And he said, how? And she said, by the Holy Spirit. And he said, I don't believe you. That's the only thing I can surmise. That she said, or maybe she said, I don't know how I'm pregnant. Either way, <laughs> Joseph's thinking, okay, virgin birth, huh? That's how Joseph would have responded. I can imagine the you know, like, oh, really? Oh, right, Mary, you're pregnant and you're a virgin, are you? Okay, interesting. You know, that's what must have happened. Joseph must have been, she says she's pregnant and she hasn't told me who it was. This sounds kind of gross. I maybe sound like I'm trying to make a cheap joke out of it. I'm not. It's, it's, I want you to understand it was scandalous. It was enough to make people shocked and think, this is, this is weird. We, we're not the ones that find it scandalous. They would have found it scandalous, more than we do, actually. And, and yet it happened. It happened. It's right here. So we mustn't dismiss these people and say, oh, they're a bit thick. Now, they had to face the, the weirdness of it themselves. Now, Joseph himself... God came to speak to him later. That's what happened. After he got the shocking news, then an angel comes to him and says, Joseph, don't divorce her because the baby that is in her womb is actually from God. And so it went ahead. Now, many people have, have also despised this story because they think, well, it doesn't really fit with with other stuff. It seems like some Bible writers like Luke and Matthew may have got a bit carried away. And people do get carried away. And to be honest, I suppose this objection makes a bit of sense because there are the, the, the teachings in the Roman Catholic section of the church, for example, which have, I would suggest, gone quite far, gone too far when it comes to Mary. So the teaching has prevailed in some context that Mary remained a virgin. I, I guess there's, there's various reasons why that teaching might have gained strength. But that is not what the Bible says. 
quite explicitly, it says in Matthew chapter 1, that Joseph, when he got his visitation from the angel, it says he didn't know her, which is the Bible language for uh, sleep with her, have sexual relations with her, until after Jesus was born. But that word until suggests that, that he did later. In fact, we know that he did because in, in Mark chapter 3, we get the list of Mary's other kids. Jesus wasn't her only child. She had other children too. And yet there's been this kind of prevailing myth in the Roman Catholic Church that, that Mary stayed a virgin all her life. And there, there are various kinds of traditions that can develop where, where people will think, ah, that's, 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 that doesn't make sense, that doesn't work. And I suppose when that happens, it causes us to question the original story. And we throw the baby out with the bathwater, excuse the pun. We kind of, we, we think, well, that, that, that's obviously exaggerated, so maybe the whole thing is exaggerated. But then we need to stop and think, is the Bible, is the Bible clearly teaching this story? Or is it something that we've just kind of cooked up and got overexcited? Or is it even just that a couple of Bible teachers who we should just treat a little bit more suspiciously went ahead of the rest? And the honest answer on this is that the Bible explicitly teaches that, that Jesus was born of a virgin in Luke and in Matthew, but there are many other places scattered through the scriptures which, although they don't teach it explicitly, they don't assert it, they kind of imply it or they back it up or they, you get the impression that it fits together with the whole story. Some of them are kind of uh, sad moments, like in, in John chapter 8, where Jesus is in a dialogue with some of his opponents, and, and they start to criticize him, and, and they say, we were not born illegitimately. We weren't. Emphasis on we. Or that seems to be from the, from the way it's written, that that's what's going on. They're kind of saying, we know about you. We know that you didn't have a dad, a proper dad. And so that the idea in the wide culture that, that, that Jesus' birth was out of wedlock, or his conception was out of wedlock, is backed up in the other, in the other books, in the book of John. Uh, in, in, in Mark's gospel, Jesus is referred to as, in one place, as the son of Mary, which is an interesting way of describing it. You know, isn't this the son of Mary in Mark chapter 6? Now, in that culture, that would not be the way. It would always be the father that would be named. And yet it's the mother that's named. It seems that the story that we get is the story of this, this mother that particularly was the one that brought him into the world, the mother that was involved especially. And then later on in the New Testament, you get Paul's writings, which in various ways describe the coming of Jesus into the world as though it was distinct. The word that he uses in, in Galatians chapter 4, in Philippians 2, in, in Romans 1, it's different each time to the normal word he would use for birth, suggesting that Paul, who was Luke's close friend, they travelled together, they would have known each other very well, was, was also very aware of the background story. So the Bible is, 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 is pretty consistent, it's completely consistent in reality. The fact that not everybody in the Bible, every writer, uh, kind of describes in detail the circumstances of the virgin birth in the end is neither here nor there because it would surely be too much to ask that every single writer of the Bible would describe every single detail. It's okay if some writers go explaining some stuff and others leave that out because they're aiming to describe other stuff. That's how it fits together as a book. So I think we have a book that's consistent as, as, it, as consistent as it needs to be in teaching the virgin birth of Jesus. I say this because I guess some of us may have heard and wrestle with some of the ideas that scholars or so-called scholars have brought around saying, ah, virgin birth, you know, you can hold that lightly. That's not such a big teaching in the Bible. Wrong. It definitely is. But I asked to start with, is this real? Is this really what the Bible teaches and can we take it seriously? And frankly, if God is real, if God is God, then why would we not take the, the idea of the miraculous seriously? A miraculous birth is completely in his hands, in his control. And as C.S. Lewis used to say, if, if we understand Christianity right, every birth, miraculous or not, God is very involved with it. 
So we don't have to feel like God is somehow throwing away the laws of physics by getting involved or the laws of biology. No, it's God, is, God is involved all the time in every conception, in every, in every birth, in every unfolding of our lives. God is the kind of God that is in our lives, in the universe, and certainly showing himself through this miraculous birth. But, but let's ask the question as well, is it important? Okay, maybe we could accept that it's, it's taught as an event, but why does it matter? Does it really matter? Does it have any significance in, in, the, in the message of the Bible? And why do we recite it as part of the Apostles' Creed? We're naming the big things here. I believe in God, the, the Father Almighty, Creator. I believe in Christ, His Son, our Lord. I believe, I believe in the resurrection. These are the big things. Why do we mention the virgin birth? Is it, is it that big a deal? And I want to suggest to you some reasons why it's a very big deal. One of the reasons I guess that people struggle with the virgin birth, or have done, it, it can be because of a kind of a yuck factor. The idea that God, the, the Holy One, would be involved in, in a womb, in, in, frankly, just kind of the, the ordinary, you know, I hate to say it, just, well, you know, I shouldn't hate to say it. This is the problem, right? We, we, we are the ones with the problem. We, we kind of think, well, kind of fluids and waters and stuff is all a bit kind of gunky. But if God made it, if it's the way God brings people into the world... Then, then we need to kind of deal with our own hang-ups, perhaps a little. God doesn't seem to have the hang-ups we have. And there have been theologians that have come along through history and had to, had to set this straight. Even really early in the church, just a couple of generations in, a man called Marcion wrote disparaging, attacking remarks about the idea of God, the, the, writing to the theologian Tertullian, Saying, saying, your God who was prepared to su submerge himself in the fluids of a, of a peasant girl's womb. As if that was something shameful and appalling. How disgusting, how embarrassing. And Tertullian had to respond by saying, this, this, this is precisely. <laughs> precisely. Because the one of, this is one of the reasons that it, it actually fits so well and why it's so important. The God of the Bible is not anti-creation. There have been gods made up through history that are big time. So much so that some people have said, well, okay, there's a God and then there's this creation. So there must be a kind of in-between God who sort of does the dirty work. So that the God of the, the, the great God, the, the, the important God, doesn't have to get his hands dirty with creation, because creation is basically filthy and embarrassing. Well, in the virgin birth, we have the final booting out of the door of that idea. That's gone, surely. God has put paid to that forever. No, 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 no. God being born in the womb of an ordinary lady says a great deal about the kind of God he is. His attitude to creation, to the world that he made, his willingness to say, it's good, it's good, it's good. I'm pleased with my creation. I, his willingness to embrace it, his willingness to be involved with it, to engage with it. it it's, it's clearly taught throughout the whole Bible. This is a different God than the sort we might make up. But it's shown very con uh, conclusively in the virgin birth. You see how fully he's prepared to identify with creation. So there's one reason why we see the importance, how, how we see the importance of the virgin birth. Second way this is important, well, what we have here is, is God dealing with the, the failings of the human race. God, God coming in to provide another humanity, a new humanity. Still human, not pretending to be human, born of a real human, and yet born from above. 
When you read Luke's gospel, which we've been looking at already, you notice it's, it's, it's descriptions of Jesus' ancestors a couple of chapters later. So when you get to, to Luke chapter 3, it has the genealogy of Jesus, one of the genealogies in the New Testament. And the last person it traces back to, the first man in his ancestry is named as Adam. The first man in the Bible, the first man created, right back. It's going back to the very beginning, the, the very beginning of all humanity. And the way that it describes him is Adam, the son of, and you're expecting, because you've been hearing son of, son of, all these people, Jesus, the, you know, the son of, 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 of so-and-so, Joseph, the son of so-and-so, he like all these various sons of, sons of, sons of, sons of, sons of. Jesus is obviously son of Joseph by adoption. But they keep getting sons of various names, and then you get to Adam, son of God. Son of God. Now, we know that Adam is not meant to be the only begotten son of God that we've, we talk about in the creed. But we do see the point that, that God created mankind with a special relationship to him, to represent him, to love and know him, to be safe with him, to feel that God was a father to him and, and the, man, the man could be like a son to him and that there would be this, this unity between them and this willing uh, ability of Adam to represent God to creation. That was the plan. The plan was for people like you and me, human beings as sons and daughters of Adam, to flourish in the world, to uh, have freedom, to never have struggle or pain, to never have sorrow. To, to never feel guilty, to never feel ashamed, to never feel fear, that these things would simply be alien. They, they were not meant to be part of life. That was God's plan. And our representative, our father, our captain, the one that was there on the pitch for us, the one that represented us when it counted, the one that carried our hopes and dreams, the one that voted for us, if you like, was Adam. This is right there in the teaching of the whole Bible, that, that, that God deals with representatives. A bit like when we, we send our MP to Westminster, we, we vote someone in and we expect them to, to somewhat represent the concerns of the constituency. And we can write to them, we can, because we voted them in. And, and we hope that they will speak for us, that they're our representative. And Adam is our representative as the human race. And by the way, not a misplaced one, a fairly justly chosen one, a well-chosen representative. He's, he's what we're like. What he did is what we would have done. What did he do? He declared war on God. The son of God, as he's described here, decided to not be the son, the child of God. Decided instead to be the child of, of himself. Declared independence. Cut himself off. Refused God. Wanted to be his own God. Decided to replace God. That's what he did. And we, ever since, have lived in the results, in the, in, the, in, the, in the outcome. Everything that has gone wrong with the world, everything that's gone wrong with our lives is the outcome of that prior initial fall into rebellion. God's son took the human race into destruction. And here we see this, this young virgin girl being told, you'll have a son. In fact, you're going to have the Son of God. This, this one who you, you bring into the world will be the Son of God 2.0. Except in his case, he's the eternal Son of God. Different in every way, or at least different in this divine way than Adam. This is, this is God himself, God the eternal Son, who's been with the Father forever and ever, coming into the world. Coming into the world to mend the mess, the broken disaster that Adam left. 
There's a hymn writer of, of 150 or so years ago, John Henry Newman, who put it like this, O loving wisdom of our God, when all was sin and shame, a second Adam to the fight and to the rescue came. That's, that's the teaching of the Bible. And here, here we have God giving his son. And so you see why this is significant. You begin to understand the, the significance of this miraculous birth, born from above, born unto a woman, born conceived in, in the womb of, of a peasant girl for sure, must be human and yet must be divine. And this puts, puts the human race destiny on a different pitch altogether. Because the, the, the dire affliction that we're all under, the terrible danger that we all carry, is, is that we, we, whether we're nice people or bad people, according to our own kind of speculative criteria, the kind of way we assess each other, am I a nice person, am I nicer than him or her, or how am I, am I not doing so well, we, we kind of measure ourselves up against each other, ultimately friends, that's a that's not helpful. That's not a relevant measurement. We need to measure ourselves against a holy, perfect God. And according to him, we are all in Adam. The crisis has already happened. The judgment has come. The condemnation is, is faced by all of us because our representative failed. In a way, it doesn't even matter how well we do because we can't shift the fact that we belong to Adam. He took us in a certain direction. A friend of mine, an uh, Australian friend of mine, puts it like this. He, he, he at one stage of the, in, in his family tree, a few generations back, one of his ancestors committed a crime and was sent to Australia. Sent there. And that was, that was his destiny, but it wasn't just his destiny. It was the destiny of all who came after him. Because of him, because of what he did, he plunged his future generations into a, another identity, another nation. And so much that is true of my friend is true of him because of this father that went before. Because his representative made a certain decision. And we, we face that. We, we, we might think, well, I, I'm a spiritual person. I like God. I, I, I'm interested in, in Christian things. and I, I think I'm a nice person. I give to charity. I'm kind to people. My friend, if you're in Adam, your, your destiny, your, your, your whole identity is wrapped up in someone who's fallen. And we've fallen with him. And as I said, we would have done the same anyway, because he represented us fairly. And God has brought about the birth of a new Adam. A second Adam to the fight and to the rescue came. And born of a woman, born... Born of a daughter of Eve, if you like. When, when in the garden the man and the woman first fall, the promise that God gives is to Eve. He says to her, Genesis 3.15, uh, she, he talks about the pain that she will have in childbirth now. He talks about some of the, the sorrow that's coming into her life because of the decision that she and her husband made to disobey God. But then he makes this promise. He says, through your seed will come someone who will crush the serpent's head. In other words, there's someone coming. You will give birth. Womankind, a woman will give birth to a, to a, a victorious rescuer. Someone will rise up and crush the power of evil. He will crush his head, though his heel will be bruised. Mysteriously. What does that mean? His heel being bruised. Somebody who will destroy evil while he gets hurt, while he gets pain, while he gets literally pain to one of his feet. What does that mean? We start to, to see, even in the first pages of the Bible, a picture beginning to form of God's plan to bring about a second Adam who will restore all things, born unto a woman. And then the fourth reason I would say that this is to be taken seriously. So I've talked about how God is not anti-creation, talked about how God wanted to bring his son, his true son into the world, talked about how he was to be born of a daughter of Eve, particularly showing the role of the woman in this rescue plan, which suggests actually a virgin birth perhaps because it shows the, the significance of her role particularly in this. And fourthly, the reality that this shows God alone could save. God alone could do it. What's the whole point of a virgin birth? It's not the will of man. 
It's not the will of any man. No man was involved in this pregnancy. No, no human took the initiative. No one tried to fix everything. Or well, maybe they did, but no one could. No one in history has ever been able to fix our deepest, deepest problem. Our, our enmity with God, our, our messed up relationship with God, and our messed up relationships with one another as a, as a result, our fall, our failure, all that's followed in our lives. Only God could have fixed this. Only God could have brought the solution into the world. And we don't completely understand all the mysteries of this. This is why Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3, verse 15, great is, or verse 16, great is the mystery of godliness. Or the, the mystery of godliness is, is great indeed. Let me read to you. He says it like this. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Paul's, Paul's way of saying that what, we, what we've tried to understand over the centuries, how could a man be God at the same time? How could, how, we've tried to figure it out, and various people have tried and got it a bit wrong, and then others have come along. The first few centuries of the church, there was a lot of big fat arguments about this a lot of discussions a lot of people with huge beards going all around the Mediterranean trying to figure out how do we explain the humanity and the divinity of Jesus people with difficult names and and big facial hair and big hats and and uh, and, and and significantly austere attitudes because they want to make it very clear that we want to understand this second Adam we want to understand is he God really or was he created by God? Well, yeah, he was kind of created in the womb. So that means he's created. No, no, but he's the eternal God at the same time. Oh, so he's God. So he can't be man. So he's just God then. No, 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 he is man. He's definitely man. Oh, well, how can he be God and man? Does that mean that he's got sort of two personalities? No, he's got one personality. Oh, but, but does that mean he's got, he's got sort of one nature then? He's kind of a mixture of God and... No, no, he's got two natures. Definitely two natures. And it's like this massive long arguments and discussions trying to work it out. And eventually, by God's grace, we kind of arrived at some really clear stuff statements, uh, things like the, the, the Chalcedonian Council and the, the, the hypostatic union and all these sort of things that sound like big scary names, but it was important because great is the mystery of godliness and it's worth understanding. How did God do this? How did he do it? And the way he did it was he did bring into the world his son, his eternal son, to be the God-man truly God and truly man, not 50% God or 50% man, 100% God and 100% man. That's a bit mysterious. Yeah, great is the mystery of godliness. It's really, really hard to understand it, and we probably never quite will. But if it wasn't true, we would be lost. We would be hopeless, my friends. We would be devastated. There would be no light at the end of the tunnel for the human race. It was necessary for God to do this bewildering, glorious thing, to come into the world as a baby to the rescue to inherit no he didn't inherit the sins of Adam instead to assume the sins of Adam see he was born of a virgin so you could say does that mean that he didn't inherit and perhaps in some mysterious way that's part of it that without an earthly father he was somehow exempt from the condemnation of Adam and some people have speculated that it's interesting the Bible doesn't completely assert that but, but I think there may be something in that. Certainly, somehow Jesus being born into the world did not inherit the shame and the guilt that all the rest of us have done. God began a new humanity. And this is, this is the basis of our hope. It doesn't mean that he never felt shame or guilt. No, he took it on. He chose it. He chose it willingly. He received our guilt on the cross. He chose to carry it and then rose, having dealt with our sin and shame forever, rose again from the dead. It's interesting to me, that we're talking about, when we talk about the Holy Spirit overshadowing the womb of Mary, it's, it's the same kind of language as in Genesis chapter 1 where it says the Holy Spirit brooded over, hovered over the waters of creation. I love this. 
Even, I mean, again, just go with me. The, the waters of her womb and the Holy Spirit overshadowing. And the waters at the beginning of creation, the Holy Spirit hovering over to bring forth life, to start creation. God began creation as the Holy Spirit brooded over things. God starts new creation as the Holy Spirit broods over the waters of Mary's womb. God was doing it all over again, starting all over again. And then you get the fact that at the beginning of Luke's gospel, this unused, uninhabited womb, and then at the end of Luke's gospel, it says specifically in Luke 23, he was put in a tomb that was never used. In two dark, cut-off places, the beginning of life, the end of life. Unused places, uninhabited before. God was starting something new, brand new, the new creation. This is how the Bible uh, tells its story to us, weaves it together. So what is the difference that this makes? What impact does it have on our lives? Does it have any? Or is it just nice theology for people who've got the time? This is huge for us. This is massive for us because it speaks of empowerment. It speaks of God's ability to bring life, to bring hope and power where there is none. Again, you look at the, the verse that we read from, verse 35, when Mary says, how will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And I go forward in my Bible to the second book that Luke wrote. So Luke writes the story of Jesus in Luke 1. Then there's the sequel, which is the book of Acts. The, the book that Luke wrote afterwards, which is about the church. It's about after Jesus has risen and gone to be with the Father, the disciples, the Christians, people like us who, who love Jesus, who want to follow Jesus, people who are ordinary, weak, cowardly, confused, getting it wrong Christians with a mixed track record at best. And, and Jesus comes to them at the very beginning of the book of Acts and tells them the future, tells them the plan, tells them what God's going to do through them. And they ask him questions and then he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Similar phrase, even similar words. Where, where at the very beginning of Luke 1, we get this promise, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And you will do things you would never, ever think possible. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will give birth. And God says to his church at the beginning of Acts 1, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will give birth. Not to one baby. You will give birth to churches. You will give birth to, to peoples. You will, you will bring spiritual birth into the world. You will do things you didn't dream possible. This is the way it is with God. Have you seen the pattern through the Bible? Some of you have read some of your Bible. You've seen how this works again and again and again. God deliberately makes a habit of choosing people who it would seem are the most unlikely candidate to do something. People who, who it's, it's impossible for them to do it and they, they are forced to lean into him. And many of us, we walk through life with a sense of calling, a sense of vocation, something that I know I want to do with my life. And maybe you've, you've felt that you've got it from God or it's kind of tied up with your relationship with God. There's something you want to do with your life and you think, I, I want to do this for Jesus. I want to do this with my life. And yet there will be times you get brought to where it feels like everything's against it happening. And even though God seems to have given you the promise, God seems to say, I want you to do this for me. And you get to the point, I can't do it though. It's too hard for me. Maybe you feel that as, a, as, a, as a, an employee in your office. Maybe you feel that as someone serving in the church. Maybe you feel that just with your friends who don't know Jesus. Maybe you feel that in your marriage. Maybe you feel that with your children. I can't do this. I don't know how 
to bear fruit. I don't know how to bring life into their lives. I don't know how to help them to find God. I can't do this. I can't do this. And what happens when you hit that point of effectively kind of barrenness? You're leaning on God like you never have. You realize this will only happen because of him. And God wants us there. God leads us there. God starts with the weak. God starts with the insufficient. The people who know, I can't do this. I cannot. God has this way of starting with such people. Maybe there are times in our lives where we actually, we, we, the reason we're not bearing fruit in something is because, well, actually I'm, I'm doing something I'm not called to do. I need to get out of this lane. I need to do something else. And that, that's important. That's a, that's a whole other message. But for many of you, the issue isn't that you need to get out. And you're tempted to. You're tempted to think, well, I just, it's just never going to work. I give up. And God is saying, no, no, no. This is the point I want you at. I want you to lean in to my power to produce life in the tomb. My power to produce life in a virgin womb situation. This is God's power. This is how he's glorified. And then I see, I see the way as well that this story tells me Something about trusting faith. You notice those words of Mary at the end. And the angels delivered that this calling to her and promised how it's going to happen. And she says just at the very end, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. I guess we, we're used to hearing those words, some of us, at Christmas time. Let it be to me according to your word. This is a famous Christmas story. I've heard it in songs. I've heard it while sitting in a, in a room with lots of tinsel on the stage and a Christmas tree. And it's, it's kind of associated subconsciously with kind of pleasantness and fun and the festive season. Let it be to me according to your word. Consider what she's saying, this young girl. Okay, I trust you. I'll, I'll become a virgin mum. I'm, I'm betrothed to a man who will probably leave me. I will live my life being either at risk of my life because adultery would be seen as a capital offence or at least despised and shamed. I don't know what this is going to mean in my life. I don't know what obedience is going to mean. I don't know. But let it be to me according to your word. I trust you. It's like that, faith. We stand together in a moment and say, I believe in God the Father, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We start to remind ourselves who he is, what he's like, what we're, what we're say, saying is something revolutionary. We're saying something dangerous. We're saying something that will put us out of step. We're saying, in many ways, I won't belong. In many ways, I'm choosing a certain destiny by lining up with this creed. I believe this. Mary's saying, I believe this. I believe your t- I Let it be to me according to your word. I will choose this. I will receive this calling on my life. I trust you. I trust you. Somehow she, she found peace. Somehow she found a sense of confidence. I guess she allowed that first opening line to set the tone. Blessed are you, highly favoured woman. If you don't hear that bit, don't say the let it be to me according to your word bit. Start by knowing I'm favoured by God. I'm favoured by God. If, if God's favour is on me, if he's brought his son into the world to take my shame and my guilt and sin, to give me a new start, to deal with the curse of Adam, to make it so that I'm in Christ. I'm not in Adam anymore. I'm not. That's not who I am anymore. I'm in the, the most perfect, acceptable, beloved representative. My representative the one who stands for me right now, the one who stands before the Father, is Jesus. That's, that's who I've become. I'm joined with him. He's my representative. Highly favoured. I'm so favoured. And I'm able to say, God, you do what you like with my life. I trust you. I trust you. If you're that for me, 
if you're that for me, even when it hurts, even when I don't get the answers to prayer, even when it doesn't make sense, even when you ask me to do things that are impossible, let alone difficult, let it be to me according to your word. I trust in your wisdom.